continuing with my Pathfinder guide thingies, uh, I'm going to do the mages today. And unlike the previous Psychic and Thaumaturge videos, which were kind of just overviews, this is going to be much more like a guide. It's still going to be, you know, an overview as we go through the book. But I'm going to throw in a lot more information. Uh, information on on what you can do with the class and certain things that work and certain things that don't and tips and and tricks and theory crafting and all that stuff so we're going to start with what is the magus pointing this way the magus is the out of the box warrior mage class for pathfinder 2.0 it was that in 1.0 but it's also that in 2.0. It sort of specializes in single target damage. And it has this kind of like, if I crit, my crits go super big. If I don't crit, I'll hit pretty hard. And if I miss, I will feel bad about myself forever. <laughs> so the general layout for the class is it has... The sort of not a fighter martial style growth for its weapon proficiencies and armor proficiencies. Well, actually, it has the same armor, armor growth as a fighter, but the weapon proficiencies are more in line with the thaumaturge, inventor, investigator, uh, uh, rogue, I think. Um, and it has slower magic growth than a full caster. And. It does get mastery in weapons and mastery in spell casting, not legendary neither. And I believe it does get mastery in its armor following the fighter's growth line. So the big like difference between it and a caster caster is the spell casting tree has this growth pattern to it. So in a normal full caster, all of these slots would be filled in. With the mages, that doesn't happen. This is called bounded spell casting, and we'll get to it in detail later. But it has the sort of half caster slot slotting going on, um, and that's sort of to balance out the fact that it gets to do a lot of things that are not casting. Uh, you still get the full five cantrips, which kind of turn into your main spells, in addition to your spell slots, of which you have four eventually six but two of them are going to be purely utility in the long run um so the key feature that the class has is called spell strike and spell strike is an ability that allows you to channel magic into a weapon attack or an unarmed attack into yourself to make an unarmed attack so you're using your attack roll to deliver the spell by default the spell needs to have the attack trait um, but there is a feat that allows you to put any negative affecting spell into your weapon slash body and strike with it. That will be very complicated, and I will de like dedicate its own time for that feat when we talk about spell casting. I think. Uh, for the most part, you're going to be using stuff like Gouging Claw, the Cantrip, and Shocking Grasp, the spell, spell slot spell. Um, to focus a damaging spell on your weapon and then strike with it. Um, this ability is supported by a couple things. You have the hybrid study, which is like your fighting style, of which there are five. And Arcane Cascade, which is a unique warrior mage stance, where after you cast a spell, you can enter into Arcane Cascade and you get a damage bonus, along with some other bonuses based on your hybrid study. And you have Conflux spells. These are special sort of combat-oriented focus spells that allow the mages to blow a focus point to do sort of a combined action of things, depending on your hybrid study, um, to uh, recharge your spell strike, make it a strike, and have an effect happen all in one action. So all told, the mages... It's a capable warrior backed up by its arcane abilities. So, the basics of the class. Our initial proficiencies... Well, you... Okay, basis. 
Your key ability is strength or dex, not int. So you choose strength or dexterity when you make the class. Typically, you want 16 to 18 on either strength or dex, whichever, whichever stat you prefer. Generally, you get them to those levels, and you're going to want to level it up at every ability boost you, you have. Intelligence, though, is still important because intelligence controls your spell casting. So you're still going to need 14 to 16 intelligence to get what you can out of your spells. You have 8 plus current plus constitution modifier hit points and your hmm so your um organizing is here. So you're going to be in that middle tier again like inventor, thaumaturge, investigator, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where you have more hit points than a caster, but fewer hit points than, like, one of the big combat brutes like the fighter barbarian. Um, so you have to be somewhat careful with how you go in. Um, you have to you have to use that, use that instant to uh, not die and be tactical with your movement and your approach to the enemies. You are... With your initial proficiencies, trained in perception, expert in fortitude, trained in reflex, expert in will. Your skill training, you're trained in arcana, a number of additional skills equal to 2 plus your int modifier. Because you do kind of focus on int, you don't have a high number of that X before plus int. That's not that high, but you'll probably start with plus three so you get about five skills out of the start on top of arcana you are trained in all simple and martial weapons and unarmed attacks light medium armor and you have unarmed defense you're also trained in your arcane spell attacks and arcane spell dcs so like i said your your character growth if we go down to the advancement you get your Weapon Expertise 5, and then your Weapon Mastery is at 13. Your Weapon Specialization is 7, and then 15. Your Armor Expertise is... Or, er, Extra Spellcaster is 9. Uh, Master Spellcaster is 17. Yeah, your armor expertise is 11, and your armor mastery is 17. So like I said, you have pretty moderate growth on everything. Um, and there's nothing really special about the proficiencies for the class, honestly. There's no there's no singular thing that you get ahead of everyone. Or like with the Thaumaturge, where you get like the legendary will save at 13. And like the fighters have that legendary proficiency in a weapon group at 13. Magus just kind of gets, like, the B plus A minus on everything. Which is kind of what the class wants because of what it does. Mixing combat with spellcasting. So your, your uh, class features, it's a standard array of things um, up until spell strike, Because it'll give you your information on your arcane spellcasting. You get a spell book, you get cantrips. Pretty much pretty much standard. You're you're casting like a wizard, but you have that limited spell slots thing going on. So spell strike. This is this is the bread and butter and the doom and gloom of the mage's class. So spell strike is a two action ability, and you can use it as long as it's recharged. So um, you channel a spell into a punch or sword thrust. To deliver a combined attack. Obviously it can be any weapon or any unarmed attack. Um, so you take any spell that has a one or two action cast uh, cast time. And requires a spell attack roll. So basically any spell that's one or two actions with the attack trait. Um, you slap it in your weapon. And then you strike with it. What happens here is you will roll your strike. And you deal your weapon damage. When you're successful, and the spell will also deal its damage. The Magus' whole thing is that it is the one class that can, by default, 
put its weapon rune modifiers on the spell attack. Typically, like a wizard, sorcerer, whatever, doing a, a spell that has the attack trait that requires a spell attack roll is going to fall behind a martial character in their ability to hit that by eventually a plus three because there's nothing that there's no rune that boosts your spell attack roll magus you get to eschew that with spell strike so there are spell strike specifics um you only target one thing even if the spell normally hits more than one target um but but it does say some whoop some feats let you affect more than one creature. Um, the reach, regardless of what it says on the spell, is the reach of your weapon. So if you're using a polearm to, you know, do that five foot reach, that means you can get your shocking grasp if you're polearming it, that five foot reach. But something like Ray of Frost, as they point out, is limited by your weapon's reach as well. So ancillary, ancillary effects... Um, your spell still has any non-target effects that it might affect creatures other than the target. For example, Acid Splash would still deal its splash damage. Tangle Foot would still apply its circumstance penalty for its duration. Um, yeah, and uh, the effects happen after the strike deals its damage, and the, the spell is thusly um, slapped in there. If a target has multiple defenses, or if a spell has multiple defenses, it targets, like Disintegrate, needing that Fortitude save, still got to roll that save. Um, if the target wouldn't be a valid target for the spell, the spell is still expended, um, but it doesn't affect the target. If the target's immune to your attack, but not the spell, it can still be affected by the spell. And then... Um, some spells have different effects based on the number of actions you spend to cast them. You can choose whether to use the effects of the one or two action version when you use Spell Strike. A spell has to take exactly one or two actions. You can't use Spell Strike with a spell that takes a free action, is a reaction, or has three or more actions. So you can't deliver a spell that requires you to cast for a minute. You can't just sit there charging up for a minute and then whack with a spell strike when something wanders in the range, of course. So, one to two action spells only. Variable spells, you gotta do the one or two action versions. And meta magic. Meta magic cannot be applied to a spell strike because spell strike is considered a combined activity. And as a combined activity, you're striking and casting a spell, not just casting a spell. So capital C, lowercase a, capital S, cast a spell as an activity. Spell strike has that in there, but is not casting a spell technically. And it does have a recharge, which is right here. So after you use spell strike, you can't use it again until you recharge it. And recharging spell strike is a single action that has the concentrate trait. So you have to... Spend that action, you do a little concentration, and then your spell strike is back. Um, so, spell strike can get really complicated, and it actually can be pretty confusing for figuring out exactly what goes on with certain effects. I'm thinking of the recent Phase Bolt spell. Specifically, if you multi-class over to a Psychic and get the Amped Up version, where... Phase Bolt itself ignores the circumstance bonuses from, like, a shield. But, and I think it can actually reduce that even further. So it has, like, this railgun punching a hole through defenses thing going on. Um, especially the amped up version. So there's a question as to whether that would apply to a spell strike. I think it would, but... Because it says, you know, ancillary effects still happen. I guess that would affect the spell strike. But, of course, that's also something where it's like, yeah, it's extra D4s, which isn't exactly the biggest dice roll. Um, so it kind of balances itself out with that. There's also some question for, like, Shocking Grasp's bonus against targets wearing armor, metal armor, or metal targets, where do you get that bonus for spell striking with Shocking Grasp against them? 
I would say yes, because ancillary facts still happen. But you might have someone who is uh, very specific in how they want something to happen with those effects like that. And they may say no. Um, at the end of the day, that that is probably up to a GM. I, I'm not gonna lie. If I were GMing a Magus, I would just let them have those effects because that just makes it that much more fun and cool. All right. So, hey Pikachu song, I did see you. <laughs> I just wanted to get through the spell strike before interrupting to say, hey. Yeah, we're doing Magus today. Um, I'm gonna kind of try to keep it an informative guide. As much as I can as I go. Um, so, next up we have Arcane Cascade. So, Arcane Cascade, one action. The requirement to use it is uh, you just used your most recent action to cast a spell or make a spell strike. So, you can see certain abilities will specify cast a spell or make a spell strike. Because they are technically two different things. It's just cast a spell is... is combined into that spell strike so this is a stance so what happens is after you cast a spell or make a spell strike regardless of if the spell is successful or not you can enter a stance where your melee strikes um gain the uh like a tiny bit of that magic you just used so you deal one extra damage of a type related to the spell you cast um and increases the two damage you have weapon specialization Three with greater weapon specialization. Not a huge amount of damage, but it's free bonus damage. And the damage type, like I said, can vary. So it can actually help you punch through elemental weaknesses. So for abjuration or evocation, you get force damage. Conjuration or transmutation is the same type as your weapon or unarmed attack. Divination, enchantment, illusion is mental damage. And necromancy gives you... Um, negative damage. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit on that text. Because that should make it easier for me to read, for one. But I think that'll all be... Some... Let's do one more. Zoom. Just making sure also... Oh, no. I think that's our limit on zooming in. Because <laughs> we got to make sure... we got to make sure both pages... Both pages are readable. Um, and I don't have to maneuver maneuver things around or zoom in uh, too much. So Arcane Cascade's all right. It is uh, it's free extra damage. Generally speaking, you can get into it in your first turn off of casting Shield on yourself, casting Time Sense, a new spell from um Dark Archive, a new cantrip. Or if you have access to it, Guidance is another really great way to spend the one action to get the spell off, spend the other action to Arcane, Arcane Cascade, and then you have that third action, which is just stuff you can work with. All right, so Hybrid Study. This is a... If Spell Strike is Major Feature 1, this is Major Feature 2. So your Hybrid Study represents the combination of your physical training in combat and your arcane study in arcane study. Anyways, your your hybrid study is how your mages do fight hard. So, there are five, and each one is related to a style um, of weapons, I would say. Uh, though you don't necessarily need a weapon for some of them. We'll go over it. So, inexorable iron is first up. And this is the big old two-hander style. So great axes, great swords, pole arms. Um, each hybrid study has a bonus for when you enter Arcane Cascade and a Conflux spell. I think... I think we'll hit up the... Mm, I might save the Conflux spells for the actual spell casting part. So I'll, I can tell you what each one does, though. Anyways, an Exorable Iron, when you enter Arcane Cascade, you gain temporary hit points equal to half your level. Every turn. You just get free temporary hit points. Constantly getting them back. Which is pretty nice, honestly. Because you don't have a shield, and you only have medium armor. So you just 
constantly gain these this like pool of hit points. I would probably say inexorable iron is the weakest hybrid study. Partly because if you're not getting hit, you're not actually taking advantage of those temporary hit points. It's almost contradictory because you don't want to get hit because you could take real damage. But also if you're not getting hit, those temporary hit points are just going to be there and you don't regen them or gain new ones or anything like that. So, um, oh, and there is a caveat for all of these where in the case of an external iron, you have to have a weapon, melee weapon in two hands to get the temporary hit points in Arcane Cascade. So there is that. Um, now, each of these hybrid studies has a level 4 feet and a level 10 feet. So for uh, in Extra Iron, there's Devastating Spell Strike and Sustaining Steel. And then uh, their Conflux Spell is Thunderous Strike. I think I'll cover those in detail when we get to feats. But Devastating Spell Strike adds Splash Damage to your Spell Strikes. Um, sustaining steel, there's a note I have on it when I get down to it that it says whenever you cast a spell using a spell slot, I, I would assume it also includes spell strikes, but it specifically says cast a spell, um, you gain health back based on the level of the spell. And the conflict spell, thunderous strike is a cone of sonic damage that can potentially knock down, doesn't deal a lot of damage. I didn't mention this either. Conflux spells, they cost one focus point, they combine together multiple things into one action, which I said earlier, and they all recharge your spell strike. So you get the, in one action, typically, you get damage, an effect, and a recharge on your spell strike. And it's different based on each of the hybrid studies. In the case of Thunderous Strike, it's a cone of sonic damage. It's not a lot, but you make a strike, you get the cone of sonic damage as the effect, and then you recharge your spell strike. So an extra iron... My recommendation would be something like get a pole arm, either something with a bigger damage dice like a halberd, or something with a lot of traits on it, like say a glaive, um, and or I think it's a a fauchard has trip, I think, and you kind of play it as like a man on a bridge where you have the the reach for it, and then you can spell strike through the reach. And then you can also enlarge yourself because you do get enlarge, which we'll cover. We'll cover studio spells later, but you get enlarge basically on your list of prepared spells as an option. So you can make yourself really big and cover a very wide area. And then you have this constantly regening pool of temporary hit points. So you can play it very much as a tank. But you got to be careful because you're still only eight hit points per level. Um, it's still really neat, uh, and I will I will point one thing out though. There are a couple. There's one other one other hybrid study can actually wield that two hander if they really want to. Um, but we'll get into that when we get the sparkling tarsh. Uh, next up though, laughing shadow. So laughing shadow, I think, is what people would consider the default choice because of what it provides. So this is the, I have a weapon in one hand and nothing in my offhand style. So it's one handers. It could be dexterity or strength. Um, but you always have to have to get the maximum out of it. You have to have that free hand pretty much free the entire time. So while you're in arcane cascade, you get a five foot status bonus to your speeds. If you're unarmored, you get a 10-foot status bonus. So if you're a dexterity magus, you can pretty much get 10-foot movement speed just for free. Because you're going to have that high dex and you don't need armor. So if you have a free hand while you're in the stance and are attacking a flat-footed creature, you increase the extra damage to 3 from Arcane Cascade. From 1 to 5 from two with weapon spec and from three to seven with greater weapon spec. So you deal more damage in your arcane cascade while you have that free hand. Um, you must have your other hand completely free, completely free for the extra damage. 
Um, the extra damage doesn't apply if you have a free hand weapon or other item in your hand, even if you would normally be able to use the hand for other things. No bucklers, no holding a scroll or a potion. Completely, completely open needs that hand to be. Um, so you get, as a conflict spell, Dimensional Assault, which is you teleport half your speed and make strike, recharge your spell strike. Really good for getting the Magus' action economy going. I didn't even talk about action economy. I might have to do a whole section on that. Because Spell Strike is a two-action ability, you kind of have to weave it in to this, this character's turns, where you may have gap turns. And this Dimensional Assault ability could really help you, at least once per, per combat, could really help you uh, mitigate some of your action economy um, issues. The two feats are uh, Distracting Spell Strike, I believe, and I don't remember. <laughs> Dang it. I was hoping I'd be able to just do all this out of my brain meat. It is Distracting Spell Strike, where you can do a feint during the Spell Strike. Um, and the feint gains the Arcane Illusion visual traits. So you're kind of doing a magic feint, though it's still a feint. And then the 10th level feat is Dimensional Disappearance. That's right. So you can do your Dimensional Assault and opt to not attack with the strike that's in there. You still get your Recharge Spell Strike. And you can opt to not attack, in which case you turn invisible. So you get a free cast of invisibility. Uh, it's a really good tactical option. Um, and it can be really good for setting up a... You know, a sneak attacking, flanking strike, too. Uh, you can also just do it for movement in that case, because you can just teleport half your speed. So, all, all told, Laughing Shadow is very good. It is very much emphasizing the Magus' striker nature, because you get bonus damage, bonus movement speed, and you get that quickie teleport. They can get in and strike, and then spell strike. So, next up, Sparkling Targe. This is, like, my personal favorite. So, Sparkling Targe is the sword and board magus. Sparkling Targe enables you to block things that are normally unblockable, like Dragon's Breath or Magic Missile. You get the shield block, general feat, for free. Um, and while you're in Arcane Cascade, while your shield is raised, that circumstance bonus to AC also applies to your saves for spells and other magical effects. In addition, damage you take as a result of a spell or magical effect while you're in Arcane Cascade can trigger your shield block reaction, even if it isn't physical. When blocking damage in this way, increase your shield's hardness by amount equal to the damage from Arcane Cascade, 1, 2, or 3, based on your weapon specs. Um, these benefits apply whether you're using an actual shield, the shield spell, or something else that works like a shield, such as a raised tome if you have the raise a tome feat. So, Sparkling Targe just lets you snap that shield up, and you block everything. Fireball coming in. You see that fire explosion? You can shield block that if you have your shield raised. The fourth level feat is called Emergency Targe, which lets you snap that shield up as a reaction. Uh, you can get that plus one or two bonus to your your saves, your AC, and avoid potentially uh, death-inducing effects. So, an important thing to note with this one, too, is you can cast the shield spell with shield block. So, if you're wielding that two-hander, like a bastard sword, it's probably my favorite weapon for a Sparkling Targe. You can go in with those meaty bastard sword dice while you're two-handing it, and pop that pop shield up and get a plus one to your defense you can shield block with it or not whatever you need and then you're still swinging that two-hander around and then shield breaks spend the action or two or whatever pull out your real shield i just punched my microphone just gave it a nice gave it a nice uh a hook um and then you know you're ready to go on on uh defending yourself like i said the fourth level feat is emergency charge which is the standard reactive shield. 
but it also can react to spells and spell like effects, magic effects coming in and hitting you. The 10th level feat is Dazzling Block, where if you block with your shield, you can shoot a cone out that's a flash that can dazzle and blind on reaction, helping you mitigate enemy attacks. And your conflict spell is Shielding Strike. For one action, you get to make strike, raise your shield, and recharge your spell strike. Very efficient. Very, very good conflict spell. I think Dimensional Assault's better, but this is the second best conflict spell. And one of the reasons why I like Sparkling Tarsh so much is Shielding Strike. Because it just basically once per combat, possibly more, you get to strike, recharge, put your shield up. It's everything you want to do as a Sparkling Tarsh Magus, all at one all in one ability. Okay, next up, Starlet Span. Starlet Span is the ranged spell striker. That's all it gets. And I say that like it's nothing, but it really is very good. Spell Strike is melee only by default. Starlet Span takes and makes it a ranged ability. You don't get any bonuses for Arcane Cascade, which is whatever, honestly. And you can only Arcane Cascade off melee strike still. So, if you're making a ranged attack within the first increment of your weapon, which I think for like a short bow is 60 feet, um, you can attach any of your normal spell strike spells to it and fire. No more. A- There's no additional actions. It's still a two-action ability. So Starlet Span has a very efficient route for its actions where you can spell strike and then recharge in the same turn and spell strike the next turn, recharge, etc., etc. And your gap turns are significantly reduced because of that. The feats are, I think it's Starlet Eyes gives you the ability to reveal enemies that are hidden. That actually might be Shooting Star, it's Conflux spell. Um, And then it has Meteoric Spell Strike at 10, which adds a trail of damage behind all of your slot-based spell strikes. So if you use a, a slot spell slotted spell, a spell with an actual level, not a cantrip where it has a cantrip level. Um, It will create a line between you and the target that is damage. And that damage is equal, I think, to double the spell level, which is why it requires spell slot spells. Um, You know, the the conflict spell, shooting star, you make a strike, reveal the enemy, and recharge your spell strike. The last hybrid study is Twisting Tree, this is the staff-based magus. I remember the playtest for the class where there was only, like, there were three of these, and I think it was, like... <sighs> what were they? I think it was, like, Arcane Slide or something. And then I think there was, like, the two-hander one, and it was called Sustaining Steel. And then they, they changed it to an extra iron. But Twisting Tree was something that was recommended by players as let's put a magus in that focuses on using staves because staves are a magic thingy right so mages with staves it's like the most standard mage trope out there why not have the magus take that make it a weapon here we are so twisting tree uses a magical staff um and while you're wielding a staff in one hand the staff will adjust its shape and weight, and you gain the Agile trait, and you increase its dice size to a D6. From D4, I believe. While you're willing in both hands, it lengthens, twists, and reshapes, gaining parry, reach, and trip. So you have now a reach weapon for your spell striking, but you can also use it for defense with parry, and you can use it to trip. While you're in Arcane Cascade, you can interact or release to change the grip on your weapon as a free action when you strike with your staff, including strikes made with spell strike. This happens before you roll your attack roll. You can also interact to change your grip on a staff as a free action triggered at the end of your turn. So you can switch between one hand and two hand mode as a free action. Normally, I when you want to grip a two hand weapon from one hand, it requires you to spend an entire action to do it. 
Twisting Tree pretty much can do it however they want. You want the little little bit extra dice and you're doing a one hand move, you got you got it. You want to switch to reach and reach out and poke someone, you got it. Your feats are Student of the Staff, which does a lot of different things, and we'll talk about them. Pretty much necessary for the weapon. And then you have Lunging Spell Strike at 10. Lunging Spell Strike gets comically awesome. And I think is like the selling point almost for the entire Twisting Tree um, hybrid study. With Lunging Spell Strike, you basically give a, a range to your staff based spell strike. I think it's five feet times spell level. So you can actually get these insane reach poke with the staff type of thing. You know, 30, 40 feet. Eventually. Well, 45 feet is as far as you can go. But still, 45 foot reach on a melee attack. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. Spinning staff lets you hit two creatures, I believe, um, and recharge your spell strike. So it's a strike, strike, recharge your spell strike. So, yeah, conflict spells, it says here, um, you gain a focus point. Uh, you can do the refocus activity. And conflict spells uh, recharge your spell strike. Um, if you... Uh, oh, yeah, and there there are feats that give you more. And you can still only have three points in your focus pool. Standard focus point rules there. But, yeah, there are, there are mages feats that give you more conflict spells. And they have their effects, have their costs for actions... Um, but all of them recharge your spell strike when you use them. So those are kind of the the basics of the mages out of the gate. For leveling up, it's a standard. It's the standard thing that all of the classes have up to seven when you get studious spells. So yeah, on that tree, going to point it out again. You have the bounded spell casting. So you don't actually have the full set of slots. You're missing the the lower end slots for basically utility filler. To make up for that, you have studious spells, which you get at 7th level. You can see these little asterisks here. That's where your studious spell slots go. You get two studious spell slots, and they can only be filled with a limited number of spells. So at 7th level, you gain two special 2nd level studious spell slots, which you can prepare... Spider Climb, True Strike, and Water Breathing in. You can additionally throw another spell in that list based on your hybrid study. But at 11th level, you add on... The, the slots become 3rd level slots. Um, and you add Haste and another spell from your hybrid study. 13th level, they become 4th level slots. And you add Fly and a further additional hybrid study spell. Um, so they actually have this listed in the wrong order because I think an actual iron was called sustaining steel in the play test and they probably forgot to just move this but we'll go we'll put an actual iron first an extra iron at 7th level you get enlarge 11th you get earthbind 13 you get dimensional anchor the real big add here is enlarge like I said earlier where if you're playing an actual iron you can go and get enlarge in this slot for free you could put both spell slots as enlarges and that just makes you bigger gives you more reach or just gives you reach if you have like a great sword or something and it makes you a bigger threat on the battlefield with those big old two-handers earthbind basically it's a flyer down to you dimensional anchor keeps a teleporter close to you i believe the spell does um so it's it's some nifty battlefield control but i think enlarge is the the star here for an extra iron um, I would say also True Strike. True Strike is a big thing to grab up for all of these. So if you do like a True Strike and an Enlarge, super, super helpful there. Um, and then as you go, like you add Haste in there if you want and, you know, other things fly. Uh, I would say Spider Climb is okay. Water Breathing is very situational. Um, but if you need those, you can, you can throw them in these slots. So Laughing Shadow, you get Mirror Image. Shift Blame and Dimension Door. So Mirror Image is nice. It's a nice defensive spell. Shift Blame is new to this book. And it is 
I believe the spell equivalent of I didn't do it, he did it. And then the target makes a save on that. Uh, and then Dimension Door is great. Dimension Door is the big ad for this at 13, where you just get a free Dimension Door spell slot. <laughs> I'd, I'd maybe even hazard doing Dimension Door in both of those slots. Um, really, really good little teleport ability, in addition to Dimensional Assault. Sparkling Targe gets Resist Energy, Warding Aggression, and Stone Skin. Resist Energy and Stone Skin are really good defensive abilities, and it further emphasizes Sparkling Targe's tankiness. Warding Aggression, I think, is okay. If I recall the spell correctly, Warding Aggression is you tag an enemy with the spell, and you have to strike them and successfully strike them, and then you get a defense boost against them. If you miss that strike or don't strike them at all, Warding Aggression's effects go away. But for me, Resist Energy and Stone Skin are just very, very handy to have, especially if you're going to be up front and you're going to be like, I'm going to tank that freaking Dragon Breath. Watch me. You can Resist Energy, Arcane Cascade, and then Emergency Targe, you know, raise that shield against that Dragon Breath, and you will probably be laughing more than a Laughing Shadow at that point, actually. Starlet Span, you have Dark Vision, Wall of Wind, and Freedom Movement. Dark Vision could be a whatever spell, depending on your character and their heritage ancestry, heritage slash ancestry slash feats you pick up. Um, Wall of Wind is protection against projectiles at you. But the real draw here is Freedom Movement, which has always been a good spell. It's always handy to have a get out of effects free card to just cast and run away because that's what you as a sparkling or a uh, starlet span probably going to want to do oh and i forgot to mention something about starlet span you can still melee spell strike you're not restricted from doing melee spell strikes so you can play an all ranger magus if you want where you can be up close and personal and then like pull out a throwing knife and whip a throwing knife at someone to spell strike um but yeah Freedom Movement, very nice grab from that. And Twisting Tree has Magic Mouth, Slow, and Blink. I don't think these are that handy. Blink can be, but I would say this is probably the weakest of all five for Studious spells. To the point where I don't think I've ever actually thought of the Studious spells for Twisting Tree when I think about Twisting Tree. So, yeah. Those are studio spells. You get them at 7th level. They're pretty handy, and they, they do help sort of relax your spell slots by giving you slots for really good utility. Very, very specifically, True Strike is is like... I would I would consider it like one of the main mages spells, almost on the level of Shocking Grasp and Gouging Claw, where you're going to want True Strike. It just helps you aim those spell strikes right in, and you can help you fish out crits. Um, haste and Fly are really good additions too. And then, you know, your your hybrid study ones are also a variety of handiness in there. So, the rest of the class, class layout, you got your standard, you know, weapon specialization, per, uh, perception increase at ninth, which, by the way, you only ever become expert in perception. Might want to pick up canny acumen late on, later on to get master, but yeah, you, you do have kind of a poopy um, perception uh, training level. You do get master in will saves and master in fortitude saves, which is fine. Um, and you get your mastery, like I said, in weapons at 13, spell casting at 17, and armor at 17. The last sort of capstone feature that isn't a feat is double spell strike. So at 19th level, you can extend the magic of your spells you store with Spell Strike. After you make a Spell Strike with Spell you cast from a Spell Slot, you retain an echo of the spell, storing it in your body. The next time you Spell Strike, you can cast the same spell again without expending a Spell Slot. If you choose to cast a different spell with Spell Strike, or go one minute without using the stored spell, the stored spell dissipates harmlessly. So, this can help you at the in the end game just cast more Spell Strikes. You gotta land those Disintegrates, you're just throwing out Disintegrate Spell Strikes. You, you can double them up right here. So that's the uh, that's the basics, ish, of the magus. So there are more things to go over with feats, and there there is something to be mentioned about 
action economy with this class. But yeah, that's that is the basic overview for the Magus's like framework. So in the next part, I think we're gonna do feats and then spells and then multi classes. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? For heritages and ancestries, I didn't mention any of them. Because that's a very personal thing to me. Like, my main magus that I, I have in Path Builder is an elf, but based on strength. So, you don't have to be super proficient in your choices for your ancestry slash heritage. He's an elf o read that focuses on strength and int. So, not the biggest health pool out of the gate, but, you know, cool mages things he can do mixed with the O-Read things and the Elf things. So, the the overall idea is, with Ancestries and Heritages, to pick what you like. And if you want to do something proficient, line up the ability boosts with the type of mages you want to play. So, if you want strength, pick up, you know, humans, orcs, the things that have that strength boost. If you want dex, elves, gnomes? Maybe gnomes have it. Humans, of course, still. Uh, and just throw throw those boosts onto strength and dex. Same thing with backgrounds. Strength, dex, and int are your big grabs. Constitution is important. Wisdom is also important. But yeah, as long as you're getting that strength or dex, then int, you're good to go on your ancestries, heritages, and backgrounds. So, yep. Next part, going to be the feats.